in our stage shows, I started writing songs from a bluegrass perspective because I didn't think there were many songs uh, for women to sing that were written from a woman's point of view in bluegrass when I started in bluegrass, which was basically 1972. So I started writing as I do a lot of creative things for a real purpose, to serve a purpose. Um, and uh, I tried to put my own personal experiences into my song. So I guess the first one, song that I wrote that we recorded and actually performed on stage was uh, Riding Around on Saturday Night. And so that was about a personal experience. Um, and I guess other songs tended to be mostly personal experience. I didn't write a whole lot of songs that were uh, the universal experience. And I guess, uh, well, I guess I have two categories of songs. I have funny songs, like Riding Around on Saturday Night or I Ain't Domesticated Yet. Uh, and then I have sad songs, which we don't really perform too much. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my creative process is mostly trying not to think. Why are you looking like that? <laughs> <clears throat> I think that... My mom's taking pictures through the window. <laughs> With the flash on. Um, I think that the, the best time that I'm creative is when it's not planned and it's just spontaneous and it just it's probably the last thing that I would think that I'd end up doing and that's when it's the best because you don't have any preconceived notion of what it's supposed to be like or like what how it's supposed to go or what you're gonna get out of it you don't have any expectations and so it's easier to just do it mm -hmm. and that's that music or just trying to solve a problem. Um, <clears throat> I guess a lot of it has to do with the tools you got. Um, whether or not you're just sitting around using your mind or using your hands, I would say um, being creative would be being able to work with what you got and make the most out of what you're working with. Some of the best things I've ever played have come out of horrendous mishaps that I just embraced. It might have been a mistake or something, but you go, that works. <laughs> you know? Make a bunch of mistakes. Yeah, just go out there, walk the plank, man. Don't, don't hold back. And, uh, you know, if you fall, you're not going to hurt yourself too bad. Um, get up on stage and overcome your nerves as soon as you can and uh, that'll carry over into your practicing It'll just give you more confidence to mess up basically you need to mess up until until you you've identified what messing up is and then you can better avoid it <laughs> the, the things that keep us back are the doubt, the judgments um, a lot of times we have friends that are not encouraging, only not because they're trying to be discouraging, but because they're actually, they can be jealous, honestly, of, um, especially if you're coming out of something, you're breaking out of a block or something, you know, they will often feel like maybe you don't have enough time for them anymore, and uh, there's guilt involved with that a lot of emotion. So I think surrounding yourself with the nurturing environment and having people that you trust to let you be yourself and to let you create is very important. And then opening yourself up to a creative energy is taking a walk in the woods, you know. <laughs> it really is. Like, if you get frustrated, I always feel like when I take my shoes off and like walk in the grass, even for like five minutes, I feel better. Like it's, it's grounding yourself, it's reconnecting yourself to the source. And there's all different ways of, of pulling and pouring into that well so that you have a continual amount of things to share. Because it's a gift and you have to share it. When you put a pencil in the hand of a kid, 
and you start to give them the tools to be to express their creativity, stuff comes out that there's no limit. I think that one of the reasons that children are so creative and have such a just wide variety and um, reach of creative thoughts and energy is that they haven't learned or haven't been taught that any limitations to it and inadvertently when we say to them oh that's silly or oh that's not right you know sing it the right way or do this the right way <clears throat> we're we're almost telling them you know don't be that creative um, and it's hard not to do because you know you want you want them to do the song right or sing the right words or you're trying to teach them what the words are and you think that you're teaching them um, you know how to do it in a way that's appropriate but almost letting them go with it and have fun with it is is expanding their creativity um, you know and going oh that's a good one you know I like what you did with it or that's a good way to create it on the far side of the house. You know, their vision for things, I think, should really be, should be respected in a, in a broader way because, because they, they have the capability and the ability to see things from a perspective that I think we, we as adults usually have lost. And so I think realizing that and giving them credit for that is, is one way that we can, we can keep creativity going. That's probably a big part of being creative is learning to remember how to play because that's all kids do is they create their own whatever they want to get into it's all it's all right there for them whatever they want to play around with whatever kind of world they want to create they can do it easier than anybody else probably so if we can remember how to do that then I think <clears throat> that's probably hit on something real good right there about playing. A lot of children are, you know, ridiculed for trying to be creative. Yeah. In the creative part of their mind and then it's like, no, no, no. It's Adhere awful. to what's already happened. It's yeah, and I, I do know a lot of parents who uh, discourage their children from encouraging, uh, from uh, pursuing art as a career. I, I see that a lot other things that are creative like okay go to medical school but don't figure out something new just adhere to the standard of practice you know the medical standard of care what's already in the textbook is all you need to know don't go out on a limb and create something discover something new don't do that time when I was little I think I was in maybe the first grade I had this this um, pencil box and I wanted to make this art piece in the top of the pencil box using glue. So I put a layer of glue, a, a, like a perfect layer of glue on the top of the, the pencil box. And I was gonna stick little things in it and make like a mosaic out of it kind of. And my teacher found it in my desk because I had put it in my desk because I knew she'd be mad if, if she thought I was wasting my own glue. Um, and she found it and she said, she said, what is this? You know, like, what are you doing? And she, she, all she could think of or, or could see was that I was wasting glue. And I tried to explain to her, I said, um, well, I'm trying to make, you know, something out of it. And when it dries enough, I'm going to be able to put, you know, these pieces in it. And she was, she was just so mad. She made me wash all the glue out. And I remember like thinking like, who's wasting this, you know, the, the glue now? Um, and I couldn't even finish the thing, but I, I remember feeling like, I understood that maybe I should have saved it for like art class or whatever and that I shouldn't have been doing it in our break in between class. But like who gives a shit? You know, like I wanted to make some art on my pencil box. It's my glue, my pencil box, you know, who's to say that that's wrong? I think that's true with everybody, the songs that they write or the art that they do. It's um, nobody can do what you do. Just to have to keep doing it for the right reasons. 
makes you see what you're worth and what your potential is and value your own life more in a way. There's a lot of jealousy of bluegrass. It uh, used to be, I guess it still is. I'm very sorry about that. Oh gosh, how many times we, the Stowmans discussed that because we were not jealous over each other. Scott used to say, I don't care who gets the applause, just get it. And that, that's uh, real entertainers. The ones who are not jealous over each other. Scott used to say, Ronnie, if you find somebody who can pick better and you follow them around and get to be their friend, and he said, because they're probably going to the top, as top as they can go. And he said, you can learn from them, too. It's not an, your business to worry about how it compares to anyone else's. Your business is to keep it yours and to be open to the things that influence you and it. And if you withhold that, in other words, if you deny your artistic, creative validity, the world won't have it. And I mean, that's two ways. The world won't have it, they won't, the world won't stand for it, <laughs> and the world won't have it. If we don't keep up that part of ourselves, that's probably where a lot of, you know, bad <clears throat> stuff just may start backing up. It could be where a lot of sickness comes from, or it could be where a lot of depression comes from. If you don't learn to just let yourself out that way. Yeah, I mean, let it happen, I guess. It's there. You don't have to really try to be yourself. You are yourself, you know. You know, <laughs> you know just try to play the song good. Try to, you know, appreciate the melody, you know. It's really important for everybody to be willing to play with musicians, for, you know, at all levels. Because, uh, you know, even if you're the greatest picker in the world, at a certain point you weren't, and you needed somebody to help you, you know, climb that ladder, so to speak. And so, so Stu Bob Ring turn. I'll take that later. Lily Matthews, the great artist who does all the Telluride posters, he goes, Pete, you're trying to reinvent the wheel. I'm just trying to draw a hand. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, better to keep it simple and just keep trying to draw the hand. <laughs> a lot of times the producers, secretly, they, they want to be musicians. I mean, and so they had to do the next best thing, so they became producers. And uh, so they, they'll start humming your stuff, and then... Uh, after about 10 takes or whatever, uh, they'll say, well, buddy, let's go back. You know that thing you did earlier? <laughs> okay, if I can remember it. So I'm contemplating the future as a vast, wide-open canvas. The first thing I'm going to do, and literally, is I'm going to mix this color that I've been thinking of, and I'm going to drip it on a piece of canvas. I like working visually. I, yeah, another tool for artists. If people learn to draw, you know, I mean, it's a commitment because people do make their living or used to as artists, drawing and painting. Now everything's sort of digital, but, you know, to engage the hand in some Chinese brush calligraphy to, you know, to work in a, in a way that engages your body and your mind in something so simple as, as a, a deceptively simple as a, a drawing or a calligraphy. Uh, I like to do that. I find it, it's a good balance. And when it's not happening, it's not happening. But when it's happening, it's a passion. So. I'm imagining this color that I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to paint it, I'm going to pour it. That's going to be my next thing. I'm going to pour this color, this sort of greenish black sort of. I've got to be able to mix the color. I've got some pigments and things that can mix it with oil, maybe a little turpentine. And I, I've always found that to be fascinating, that the colors that you make paint out of exist all around us. 
but we have to dig into the earth to find the minerals that combined with a medium like oil or a gel or some acrylic gel, plastic, wax. That's fascinating to me because it's alchemy. You know, and then you go back and pick up the instrument, which is it's all together. <laughs> right? You just give it a little tune up and it's all complete. I like uh, different kinds of music that where I don't like the word improvise, but I, I call it like making it up making up your own part. It's a kind of music where you're gonna make up your own part. I never played scales until recently after talking with Jim Hurst for a while and listening to the way that guy practices and him scales are very important. And since I've started doing it here now, 30 years later, I'm seeing the importance of it. But I didn't back then. It was a jam. You know, I didn't play melody. I played whatever I thought I could fit into the chord progression. And I still do it in a lot of ways. But sometimes now I do search for the melody. And I, th I think, you know, that's helping me grow too. Um, I just love to pick. <laughs> could be that for a lot of folks it's uh, it's easier to play around the melody than to play the melody. I remember we played a festival in St. Augustine one time and there was a mandolin player there who was certainly making about 50 times as much as we were for the weekend and he came over to the mandolin workshop and that was nice of him. Then we wanted to play a tune, you know, and about Soldier's Joy, well he didn't know that. How about uh, Cripple Creek, he didn't know that. How about old Joe Clark? No. Nope. Turkey in the Straw? No. Nope. It turned out he didn't actually know any tunes, although he was a great jam mandolin player. And to me, the melody is the point of it. I might not be playing the melody all the time, but to me the melody is really the point of the tune. And whatever I do play on the tune, well, I want it to sound like that tune, that particular one. Otherwise, there's no point in playing different tunes. If you're going to play all the tunes the same way, you might as well just play one. All songwriters feel this, I would think, feel the same way. You know, when you finish writing a song and you know it's a good song and you've tapped into the power, I mean, it's just one of the best feelings in the world. You've, you've created something where there was nothing before. You know, you've created it. I can remember that feeling uh, so well when I wrote that, that goodbye song for Laurie. Uh, da -da. You sure? No. Just remember where you could be. You know, when I finished writing Laurie's verse about we're going to miss your solid 145, we're going to miss your yellow pants, we're going to miss your da 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 da, going to miss your old buck dance, and then will you miss me when I'm gone? I mean, the words were just flowing, and it just, and there's, you know, the power thing. And I think, you know, as I'm telling this, I think power for me has a lot to do with the rhythmic cadence and how the words fit the rhythm, and then clever things. And, you know, we're going to miss this, and will you miss me when I'm gone, bluegrass song, you know, it, it, it works. It's not so clever that a person who's never heard the song, will you miss me when I'm gone, wouldn't understand it, or wouldn't, it's not a joke, but it, it's cleverness. Uh, and I like cleverness like that. And that brings me back to other influences. I mean, I really have always liked very much songs from musicals that are, are cleverly written songs by tunesmiths and wordsmiths that uh, may be from well, like New York or people that are songwriters uh, that write songs from musicals. Uh, HMS Pinafore, this, those songs that are just clever lyrically speaking and I think that also had an influence on me because I tried to make my songs clever because I, I like to hear clever songs. I don't like to hear a song where if I'm listening to the radio and I can anticipate the next word that's going to come up, that to me is boring. It's, but if somebody can put a twist on it, so I can't, and the word I'm an, it, anticipating, they go in a different direction, either with a different rhyme or they don't rhyme it at all. That. Uh, and so while I'm talking about influences rhyming, I, I have to mention Dale Kreider because we spent so much time in Florida being around Dale who's just a magnificent songwriter 
and I don't think I realized at the time how much influence he was having on me. And I sort of spec just a little tiny bit if I could toot my own horn. Doot, doot. Maybe I was having a little bit of influence on him because we were both of us were writing a, a whole bunch of songs in that time period, and I and I know I was feeding off of him because I know his song. The sea oats were gently beholding sunbeams over the sand. Lester was born in the mountains in the great state of East Tennessee. Goes in a different direction, but you know I was I was feeding off of him, and I and, and I have no idea if he was feeding off of me. But again, it was the the his words, his cadence, his own power. The musician is made for making the music that we listen to to learn the important things of life that music can teach us and you know I was just thinking more that we are um, trying to put the, the most palatable part of our uh, audio sense into music. We're trying to use that to influence others into thinking it's good. And if they think it's good, maybe they will remember it and, and use it again and maybe possibly even learn it some way or at least play it on their um, discs or MP3 files or something. And, and Odom didn't have many artists. He had a lot of scientists. He knew they all had computers and they were all, in a sense, making art. But in, he was the biological nuclear physicist who was able to quantify sunlight from biology as well as the biochemistry of it and he didn't have any artist that he thought would be able to paint that picture or photograph that process or even um, write a lengthy scientific explanation of it. And I think that's why he suggested that I ought to try to do that with music. And he came at the right time when I had a job that would allow me enough freedom to go and visit a place that I might imagine or dream of, like in the Okefenokee Swamp, or out on the Swanee, or down in, in uh, the Devil's Mill Hopper, where I wrote a song one time. And many times I, I put myself in the very place that my um, research from a road map or looking at an aerial photograph of a place that I was seeing, maybe even just flying over it doing waterfowl counts, uh, which I did every month for a long time with a uh, Piper Cub. And I would put my mind into an aerial bird's eye, eagle eye view of that space when I was able to fly through it, you know. Seeing it from the air and knowing it from the road uh, was a real good way to feel like you had confidence to sing about Florida because you saw it from a um, multi-dimensional standpoint, being above the land of flowers and seeing sawgrass stretching into the distance and Lake Okeechobee from the air and Swanee River, uh, you know, during flood times. All of those different things were m images that my music uh, learns from. Writer is <laughs> he's, uh, yeah, he's a storyteller. So he knows all about that too. I'd say that's a big part of it as well. If you 
if you're trying to tell a story, <clears throat> you know, people use instruments, of course. But even if you don't, even if all you got is you yourself, and that's, that's it. You got your mind as a tool. You can express with your hands as a tool. Change your voice. All that stuff, yeah. Yeah, that's magical stuff. I don't know what keeps a player sort of hemmed in, you know? But I, I, I believe it's personal. I think it's a self-imposed one. Uh, I don't think it was like, you know, that they were born never to uh, get out there on the limb, you know? I think it's a decision. It's a decision made. Um, and I think, you know... I think getting out on the limb is a practice place. Sometimes you have to practice being creative. Because um, though it's fun to just kind of freestyle and doodle off and do whatever comes out, that's fun. And that's, um, that is creative and that's all it is. And then there's a whole other part to it where if you like, say, music, the more you practice your notes and where you're going, what you know sounds good from experience and that kind of thing, it almost helps you to be more precise with what you're trying to express. Um, yeah. Don't get me wrong, the freestyle thing is where it's at, just as much as being creative off of what you practiced. Um, one of the funnest things I liked with that I like with drawing, and once you get to that level of musicianship that you can pretty much do whatever you want, what comes to your mind. <clears throat> and I guess this, I, I don't, never played jazz or anything, but I'd imagine this probably is a jazz element. That's when you start going out to a place where you're not making any mistakes, I think that's a good creative zone to where you, sh you, you make a stroke and for all intents and purposes it might sound awful but you're able to bend it into something that you like. That's a good creative spot to be in. And I think that's how it is with drawing too. Sometimes if you just let it, let it ride and, um, and you make your mark and you just don't question it, no matter how it comes out, you just roll with it. Keep going, see what happens, see what it turns into. I, you know, I, I don't think that I came across, you know, came to that conclusion consciously at first, but now I think, you know, it's a little more like that um, in my, you know, in my approach to creating. You know, just go for it. And, you know, when you're on stage, know, know your limits, you know, I, I think, you know, somebody a lot wiser than me once said, when you're in the studio, uh, you know, it's important. Don't, don't try and sound uh, like who you want to be in 10 years. Just sound like who you are now. But that's the interesting thing. Creativity is timeless. And because love is timeless, because, you know, the source is timeless. Everything that we are drawn from, that's not going to change. Like we're still going to go on to be creative beings. There's no way to say you can stop or start. This is this is where my creativity ends. It goes on and on. You know, the practice of it is, um, the practice of trying to unlock that creativity is, is just as mysterious as anything, I guess. And it's kind of, I, I suppose a lot of it is trial and error, and you have to just uh, have faith. That's the first thing. You have to have faith that there is something you can do. And then you have to put your attention on it, basically. If you if you want to write music or want to paint or um, you know, study the cosmos and figure things out that no one else did, you just have to just put your attention on it and keep looking at it from every angle. And um, and it's okay to have a blank page, you know, or a blank, you know, an unrecorded piece of tape if you're trying to get somewhere. It's okay as long as you sort of took the time. It sort of points you, it starts pointing you in a direction, and if you keep doing it, it's just, it's like anything else, it's like you gotta, it's like fishing. You just gotta put a lot of lines out and keep watching them. And if they don't work, try another hole. 
you know, catching a fish, you gotta reel it all the way in or else you'll lose it. Sure, like most, like many songwriters, weak stuff just doesn't get off the page. It doesn't, it doesn't completely form. You know, it goes, you know, in the trash can or just stays in the notebook. So I guess the first way I imbue songs with power is to, to try to write the best song possible uh, in terms of choosing the best words, uh, choosing the, you know, the, for me the melody is so tightly tied to the words that uh, I, I struggle to get the best words, you know, that because words are power. I try to be aware of and not choose words and phrases that have been used again and again and again and again. Words are powerful, so you gotta choose them right. You gotta choose them the right way you say them. For, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, there's a, I feel like there's a pretty big degree of responsibility with how you use your voice and that energy. Um, you know, words can be sharp as a knife, so if, if you're trying to sing a song and it's too sharp or too dull, that's going to make a big impression on somebody or yourself. Part of it, it just comes from believing in the song myself. Uh, and if I believe in it, that seems to, I don't know, maybe a touch into the universal power source so that I'm connected to whatever it is that, that helps with the writing. If I believe in my song, if it's a song that I'm just kind of like, uh, I need to write a song, da, 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 then I don't think I make the power connection. Gamble Rogers, you know, just, 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 yes. I mean, I, uh, he was such a, uh, an influence on my musical career, uh, just, Listening to and perform, and you know, I memorized the words to all the songs that he had, that he played, and, and some of the songs that he wrote, and some of some of his long explanations. When I told Gamble I was going to flight training out in uh, Del Rio, Texas, this was uh, this was in the summer of '71. We had a conversation in Dale Crider's living room, and he told me the story of Doctor. Brinkley and radio station XERA. Dr. Brinkley was the uh, monkey gland doctor, a goat gland doctor, you may have heard of him. And he said, you know, there's plenty of material there. You could start making up some stories about it. And so I did. And the old uh, 10 minute story I used to play, I used to uh, tell before playing Rawhide came out of that uh, it had Dr. Brinkley in it, it had the Carter family, you know, it had, uh, it had all sorts of things, uh, many of them taken from real life. And so that sort of put me on the way to telling the stories. And I made quite a few of my own stories as I went along when we were playing music uh, full time. But uh, some of them were oriented toward introducing particular numbers, such as dueling banjos or rawhide. And so, uh, here lately in the last few years, especially since Gamble died, I felt very much like keeping his stories going. And so I'll tell some of my stories and I'll tell some of his. And uh, his stories are still a creative inspiration because they're so good. Uh, so I would lift, you know, I would lift lines from, from Gamble's songs and, you know, I, because I'm a songwriter, I listen intently but often unconsciously to other songwriters and so you know, words that they have used uh, like I remember ones that's come to mind from Chris Christopherson he used the phrase walking contradiction so I just lifted that for my Eminem Blue song uh, that for Gabble Lily of the Crossroads I lifted that for my song about it was awful nice of Jesus to come and rescue me and it's not like you go consciously out and, and try to lift they just just come to your mind um, I just have always been a words person.
and, and, I, and I would have to say that my very f absolutely first influence would have been m Mama, you know, because she always sang us to sleep at night, and so those sounds uh, went into my head, not only the sounds, but the words, so, uh, you know, I put that, I put that experience even in, in the couple of songs that I wrote, uh, um, and just hearing that, and then from that, you know, to the Baptist church, where I would be bored with the sermon and I'd be memorizing songs in the hymn book or looking back through the hymn book to see which tunes were the same or uh, I just was really I can remember being a little kid and singing that song bringing in the sheaves and I didn't know what sheaves were how in the world would I know what sheaves were that's a you know some farming term and so I thought it was bringing in the sheep and that was also a good Baptist terminology with Jesus and sheep and all that kind of uh, but I was just conscious of words. I uh, just always have been. Uh, so those, uh, you know, are, are very influential things in my own songwriting. <laughs> that there, that's God putting a punctuation mark, an exclamation point for what I just said. So leave that in there. <laughs> My own creativity has more to do with mandolin tunes than anything else. And when we started recording, I had to record mandolin tunes, you know. When we started recording in our own studio, that made it a lot easier to record my own tunes using multiple mandolins to do it. And uh, I don't know of anybody who was doing a lot of that at the time. Uh, this started around 1979 and 80, and I was recording tunes with two and three mandolins. And getting a different sound, you know, uh, you can put something like that on a bluegrass LP and really uh, break up the wall of banjo, as you might say, and, uh, and have a really interesting thing for the people to listen to. I did try to, to put them down as, uh, as music that would, that would stand out, uh, that didn't have too many notes. Uh, I never have had the, uh, what's a good word, the boodly doodly mandolin sound in my head. And uh, I wanted to play some notes. It's like Bill Monroe said one time, I think somebody asked him, well, Bill, why don't you play all those notes like Sam Bush does? And Bill said, well, if I was to write you a letter, I would mean every word I wrote. And uh, I like to think that I'm meaning every note when I'm playing that music. Hello. Hi, kitty. Hello. A common thread between that song and and any others that I've written that I feel like that they went somewhere was that in some way or another they had I had an emotional connection to them. And I was, even even if I, even if I made them partly fiction, I was able to connect to them in some way emotionally, and and just kind of ride on that, and and. <clears throat> But anything that I've written that has that I feel like came to fruition in a way that I felt good about, I had was able to have that kind of connection, and I think that's what saw them through. Uh, if I've tried to, whenever I've tried to just brew something without that emotional seed, I've never been able to make that work. When they do, when they do work though, it's a, uh, and something ends up being what you wanted it to be, or even if 
it evolves into something that you weren't expecting, but it but it it kind of means something akin to what you were wanting to get out. It's a great thing. <laughs> it's really a it's really a satisfying thing. A thrilling thing. Get quiet um, and make the space to be creative. Honestly, if I'm working with other people, I kind of, I kind of have to know that they understand that I'll probably sit there and, and like zone out for a second, you know, and just kind of retreat in my own mind. Because what I try to do, what I'm trying to do when I do that, is just think about nothing, so that whatever comes to mind, I feel like that's the right thing that's supposed to. It's like, um, you know, a lot of people talk about just getting creativity and energy from the universe and the stuff around them or just like the leaves or, or some, you know, sound they hear or just an impression they get. And I like to try and just like really, just really kind of push all my thoughts out of my head and just see what comes back in piece by piece and see if those fit together. I'll tell you part of this, pumpkin. Be yourself. David McLaughlin has a very sneaky creativity. People think he's a hardcore Monroe style mandolin player, but you listen to him, especially if you listen to him at half speed like I did for a while making up a tab book that was never published. If you listen to him in detail, he's playing a lot of real new stuff, his stuff, all the time even in traditional numbers. And uh, then he writes his own tunes, you know, he's written a lot of tunes. And they're original in his own way. He doesn't try to force anything. He's not trying to impress anybody with hot licks. But he's making up music that is nothing like anybody else's music. I would say my creative experience is mostly about doing something that's like all my own. That's my most fun creative, creative experience. Like writing songs, arranging pieces, composing, <clears throat> producing, figure out what you think is pleasing artistically, whether it be visual art or audio art. All, all the music that I play is in my head before it comes out. Yeah, I don't play anything and, and uh, go, wow, what did I just do? I know, I know some people do that, it's like, but I, everything, I, everything I do is thought out, not necessarily way, way ahead of time, but... Maybe a few seconds or something. Possibly, yeah. Uh -huh. So I'm always you know, figuring out what's going to happen next. I'm always changing to a certain degree, but then there's a lot of that same stuff that's in my mind, certain rules that I don't seem to deviate from. Those rules are uh, playing as clean as I possibly can, keeping it simple, I definitely am a, uh, a minimalist. Not that I don't like, uh, you know, what other people do with extremely f fancy, ornate uh, fingerboard acrobatics, or whatever you want to call it. But for my own playing, I just choose to take the path of extreme simplicity and just focus on timing and cleanliness and uh, just not too many, I don't like to play too many notes. Say, oh, that was a real fancy break, but it's not really. I've, I've, never taken a, I've never taken a fancy break in my life, <laughs> really. I mean, if you compare it to what I think of as fancy. Mm -hmm. Loosen up. Don't let your music run your personality, and don't get to thinking you're so good. I'm good. And I'm just so wonderful, and I didn't like the way he played. And don't criticize everybody. I like to criticize the way they walk or something they said or something they did. But I'm not going to criticize their music unless they really suck. <laughs> if they suck, I'll say, boy, God, you suck. I'll go and tell them. I say, honey, you shouldn't be up there. I will. I've done it a few times. Of course, people don't like it, but I ain't going to lie to them. Ain't no sense. Daddy, oh, we'd be on the stage playing, and Scott, oh, this is so cute. Scott would say, 
Pop, this man can sing better than I can, so he's got one to be off the stage so he could kiss the girls. We'd be playing a dance or something. There were some girls, pretty girls, and he wanted to make time with a few of them. And Daddy said, Dad, blame it, Scott. The last time you brought somebody up here, they couldn't do anything. Daddy, and he said, but Daddy, you don't understand. Pop, you don't understand. He would go into this. This is so good, this man. And I knew he was bad, and I would be right along beside Scott. And he said, but Dad, this man is so good. You'll really enjoy him. He'll really do good for the show. He got up there. <laughs> this is down at Hotel Charles in Southern Maryland years ago. Me and Donna was very young. But the guy got up there and he was drunk. And he had his pants unzipped and he had his hands in his pockets and he was saying jambalaya. <laughs> and he was awful. And me and Donna got to giggling. And we giggled and we fell on the floor. I was going, oh. you know, me, I went dramatics. And Daddy said, Dad, blame it, get off the stage. Who said you could sing? He said, of all the musicians out of work, and you get up here, he said, you don't even belong on the stage, right on the microphone. It may take years to really get to where you're able to grasp it and control it the way you want to. If you're working on your craft, it's always important to keep everything in perspective and realize that we're all down here for a lifetime and you know music is something that's gonna you know grow gray with your gray hair I mean you're just gonna always have it and uh, you know you don't need to perfect something right out of the gate uh, even a tune can take you 10-15 years to write um, you just take your time and uh, you know unless you gotta meet deadlines but uh, I like to really work on things. Like sometimes I'll write an A part and I won't find it a B part for a year. Or uh, I don't know, just keep, keep an open mind and keep listening. Again, expose yourself to as much as you can, as you care to, and then follow the stuff that you like and it doesn't matter what it is. If I didn't branch out and keep listening to other stuff, I think I would get stale you know my music would get stale and so that doesn't I don't want that to happen and to me style is a combination of the things that you've been informed by with this extra kind of magic of yourself that you throw into it I started out and I've been continuing I mean listening is as important as playing or creating something so I was just an appreciator of music uh, of various artists and so initially I was just trying to more or less copy that you know or uh, imitate it or try to be it you know that was my goal was trying to uh, you know say Bill Monroe I was trying to sound like Bill Monroe or play with uh, that much feeling or emotion or power or uh, texture so I was mostly trying to copy things. So there's nothing wrong with copying what came before you. And that's the trick though, is, is finding your own voice outside of that or growing out of that. But that's, that's, that's the best stuff, is the stuff that is informed by what came before it, I think. And so it's got this tradition behind it. And you are expressing that tradition in your own way. And I think with time, it comes to everybody. You know? The broader the range of music that I listen to, um, the broader the, the range of possibilities I have to go with my writing. I heard the great mandolinist Mike Marshall one time say, you are what you eat, uh, musically speaking. Listen and be somewhat selective about what you listen to. And, and don't uh, be afraid to go as far back as you can go. Go back to the old stuff. Try to find the roots of whatever music it is that you're trying to learn. Um, don't just go back to, say, J.D. Crow in the New South, but going back to Jimmy Martin and the Stanley Brothers and Reno and Smiley and the early Bill Monroe bands. And then go back to Bill and Charlie Monroe, you know, and go back even and listen to some old time music. As much as I go out and check out new stuff, um, it almost makes me love the old stuff even more, you know. And, and listen and get that music in your head and and then you'll find that you're 
your brain can take over and, and you've got this uh, encyclopedia of sounds and you can pick and choose things that you like. You know. So there's a listening process that's as, as intense as the putting out music process. Uh, one of the best things I do musically as a listener is to uh, to go to my uh, CD player that has like 300 CDs, hit random, and then hear Ravi Shankar, follow Bill Monroe, follow Hartford, follow, you know, The Who, follow, you know, whatever. Uh, that's the best jukebox on earth. Sometimes it's tempting to try to learn everything, but at some point you just want to pick the things that are most important to you. You pick the sounds that you really like and go for them. and and try to make them your own too. That's that's important when you're learning. You don't have to be spot on about everything you learn and do it exactly like the person you, you're trying to learn from. Try to learn it your own way because then you can use it. Then you're not locked into doing it the same way you learned it every time. Anything that impacts creativity impacts your whole life, you know. Learn from the masters, but don't forget yourself. Actually, that's something that Bill Monroe told me. He said, uh, I want you to play bluegrass fiddle, not country fiddle, but I want you to play like you. I like to hear that somebody's put a lot of their life into it, something that you can hear through their voice or through their craftsmanship with the notes they're choosing. And, and I would say that would spread out to any kind of music as long as someone's really putting a good putting a good tone to it, putting a good rhythm to it, and putting a lot of heart and conviction into it. That's that's what I like to hear. Yes, sir. And um, Same would go with you know, storytelling or, or drawing. Just I like to see that that element that you, that you know someone's really got their got their mindset in the zone. You can tell when someone's in the zone. Whatever instrument you picked, if you, if if you um, are playing that instrument, not necessarily a music, you might find your own music. Maintain that that soft focus and openness. They seem mundane, seem a lot more fun than they would be if you didn't think about them in a creative way. Um, I, I would say it just kind of goes back to that working with what you got thing and if you don't have too much but you're able to do something with it, it's easier to, it, it's almost like you're able to <clears throat> recognize the blessing that you have for being able to work with what you got. Uh, don't be afraid. Don't ever tell yourself no. Always follow your ideas through. Um, don't say, oh, I had this idea, but it's, it's kind of dumb. And, eh, I don't know, whatever. It's, it's stupid. Forget about it. It's like, don't forget about it. You know, follow it through. And even if afterwards you're not crazy about it, set it aside for a little bit and then go back to it with a, with a fresh mind. Um, approach it from as many angles as you can. Try to describe what you're thinking and feeling in as many ways as possible. Um, don't be afraid to see things differently. Um, you know, a lot of times I'll describe music in visual ways, and uh, I think a lot of people do that. You know, they'll maybe describe certain sounds as having different colors to them. Um, and some people, even really good musicians, you know, you'll you'll say something to them along those lines, like, "Man, it just like sounds like uh, like this kind of." brown, you know, like, big brown sandwich of, of, you know, sound, or, you know, just, you know, and maybe it makes sense to me, but then they look at me like I'm crazy. It's like, well, you know, I'm not crazy, but it does sound like a big brown sandwich, you know, I don't know, like all over my ears, like, oh man, turn that down, it's like this big brown sandwich all over my ears, you know, maybe that sounds a little weird, but, you know, you should always feel and experience how you feel and experience things in your way and don't ever let anybody else uh, tell you that that's wrong because it's not wrong that's the whole point of creativity and making things is that there's there's no right or wrong there's just what you're doing right now and what you'll be doing later
That's pretty cool. There's a Cowboy Jack Clement quote. And I think it's in regards to songwriting where he says, you know, learn all the rules. Learn all the right ways to do things. You know, learn the textbook way to do it. And then once you've learned all the rules, break every single one of them. If you just break the rules because uh, you don't know any better, then you're not really breaking the rules and you're just kind of, you know, misinformed or something. But definitely learn what other people say is the right way. Be aware of that. Be aware that that is a path and a, and a route that you can take. But then at the end of the day, forget all of it. Throw it all out the window. Do what feels good. Well, one of the one of my rules is to, in, create, in creativity is to uh, one of my rules is to always break rules. Yeah. Nice. Don't be confined to. Don't be confined to, especially to other people's rules. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> creative flow gets really strong when I just sit there with like with a rhythm machine or without a rhythm machine but I just love working out with a rhythm machine and play repetitive passages, challenge my tempo threshold and then see how many different ways I can change the same passage. Well that's tricky because um, I am heavily influenced by certain musicians and certain records and even more specifically probably certain tunes. Um, and it's hard, I mean, nothing's brand new in the world, and it's hard not to steal from people, um, especially if, if you love what they're doing. So, I mean, I don't know, you, you know, when you're writing music in this small genre, you're going to write some similar music. I mean, that hopefully, if you're doing it right, you're going to be writing some some tunes that sound like tunes or sound like they could be old tunes and I think that's like what we're all going for is to sort of write something that sounds timeless. I, I start listening to other people's you know their, their, their little ways they turn a line or, or, or whatever hey I heard a long time ago a good songwriter's a good thief uh, it's not stealing their idea and it's not stealing you know what they did it's just, you know, finding out what they did to come up with that formula that they've got. And then, you you know, you doing something on your own if you want to use that same type of technique and, you know, try to come with something. People can make amazing new music if you listen to the stuff Bill Monroe was um, creating all his life. The material Frank Wakefield is still creating. The mandolin playing that Sam Bush has done. And uh, great stuff there for example like Crooked Smile uh, and his uh, work on uh, Lonesome Fiddle Blues, Fiddle and Mandolin. This is inspiring stuff and I was listening to a whole lot of that material uh, there in the 70s, late 60s uh, and early 70s before we started playing music for a living. And these guys showed me you can play mandolin in a very intense way, you can create with it you can make good stuff. And sometimes going outside of what you do and going into something else is is really awesome because you, you really get into beginner mode. You really understand, oh, okay. And then you go through the whole thing of like, well, I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't, I, and it's great, you know, because because when you when you process, you go, no, you know, wait a minute. I know how to do things because I, I, I've learned to you know, crawl, walk, ride a bike, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's in me to do it. So I'm going to do this thing I've never done before, get into it. And in three months or six months or th three weeks, I will know what this is. I mean, the first year is kind of tough because you just, everything's feels so awkward. But, you know, once I got through that first year, it's like, it's all good, you know. And that's the thing. You, you know, you put your foot in the water and go. And get to work and save, you know, try to, try to do it and try to create because that's what you're going to leave behind, that's your legacy, whether it's creating songs or paintings or children, 
like I feel like creating is what we're here to do and we're all given the opportunity for it and I don't think anybody should be told just because they're not trying to make a living off of it or because they're not already at that level like you're not just you don't just show up one day and you're at that level it takes years of small steps to get to there it doesn't matter if you can just draw a stick figure or play one note on a guitar I mean if you're trying to create something or an environment for yourself then others will enjoy it as well <laughs> enjoy your friends and your family that's important to keep relationships happening we're all doing this to enjoy ourselves and to express ourselves um, but you know it's really important to embrace the community component of music as well. Something happens you know when you're close physically to each other and, and there's an exchange that goes on. It's that all my musical life I've been really really fortunate in having some creative people around that were real inspirations. In Florida it was people like Gamble Rogers and and uh, John Hedgecock and Dale Kreider, uh, since I moved up here, and to other people, you know, uh, it's great to have Dave McLaughlin in town, and uh, Marshall Wilburn, people like that. So the thing that has really helped me has been to have people around who could create, and whose music was always fresh, and uh, that's what's pulled me along. And you have to tell yourself, I am worth this. Um, I do deserve this. I am a faithful, I am a trustworthy person. I can stand on my own. Um, I'm powerful. I have a gift to share. It's not a burden. You know, here we have all these things we have to just dissolve about what it means to be an artist. And the affirmation and the positive thinking and writing down and just knowing and reflecting with friends is so important really important to use. Well, something you might say to somebody who's starting out is, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and make some tunes. Go ahead and tell some stories. Because you can't get there without starting out. And don't wait until you think you're good enough. Because you may never reach that point. You've got to just, if you're going to play mandolin, if you're going to write tunes, you just got to play and play and make up this tune, make up that tune. Uh, it's the same way with the stories, it's the same way with most anything creatively, I think. It takes a lot of time and effort to do these things. And you've got to be able to define where your inspiration is, and a lot of that is by doing, instead of by sitting and thinking about it or worrying about it. Don't do it to try and feel good about yourself like in other people's eyes. It, if it makes you feel good, that's great. But don't, don't rely on other people to look at your creativity and then make you feel good. It should just make you feel good. Bang, bang, bang. It's just, I'm doing it. How does it make you feel? You know, I think that's the ultimate. And that's, you know, that's the ultimate gauge that you're always gauging when you're a musician. You're just always, is this feeling right? Is this right? Is that right? Every once in a while you have to go back to in your mind to the picture of yourself when you were getting your first instrument and and the un unbelievable joy you got when you open that case and just smell the finish on it and 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 the, and the, the charge it gives you to, to to pick it up or the or the joy of singing and where when you were just first learning to sing harmony so every once in a while you just got to go back um, to try to think about the feeling of what made you excited about wanting to play and sing. It's really important to hang on to no matter how talented you become or how successful you are. Um, it's really all about, you know, inspiring that in other people. If you can help make somebody realize that jamming or playing music makes them feel a certain way, you know, that might might uplift them in a, in, a, in a way that other things can't, then, you know, you've done something useful. It is much like a secret journey, and 
many, and to be creative, anyone could be creative. Everyone is creative <laughs> and unfolds on their own path, you know. Keep doing the things that make you most creative, whether it's, you know, going on a relaxing drive, hikes, or, you know, having a glass of chamomile tea, looking out the window on a rainy day, whatever it is, keep doing that and do it for you, don't do it for everybody else. If you do it for you, uh, you're successful, even when other people may not equate that with you. And if you keep being successful with yourself someday, you'll do something that others will say, man, this is, this is really cool, I like that. I want a piece of that, I want to be a part of that. Uh, so it may take decades to really manifest what it is you have, that core of what you have inside. Time is on your side in all of this because you spend years and years and years playing music or painting paintings or writing poetry. You, you got to improve. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Be patient. And don't ever let frustration be a negative thing. Let frustration be a good thing. And embrace that. That helps creativity. People who are tr learning to play music or to paint or draw or do any form of art, they want to be better than they are at any given moment. And uh, will often get frustrated about their progress or they just feel like, oh, it's, it's too hard to get good as quickly as I want to be. You know, some of my students who they might be, have been played for six months or a year, they feel like they're not where they'd like to be because they want to be able to beat Earl Scruggs in, you know, in six months. Uh, and I tell them, you know, okay, it's, it's okay to feel the frustration and feel you know, it's okay to feel that way, but don't think of that as a negative force. Think of that as a positive force, and that will get you through. You know, keep on pushing. Don't give up. So that'll cause frustration. Will cause people to either put their instruments uh, away, shove it in a closet, or it'll cause them to say, "I'm not going to put it down until I make progress." And then when they've made progress, they're still going to say, "I'm not going to put it down because I'm not quite satisfied with where I am." And so that they end up you know, playing for hours. And so that's, you know, it's like every time I hear someone uh, really, really great, a really, really fantastic musician, uh, I know that they didn't just, it didn't, the, the gift didn't just drop in their lap. They all, everybody who I know who's amazing worked really, really hard to get there. And they also went through amazing amounts of frustration and agony and hard work, and uh, it didn't. They didn't just like wake up and go, "Oh, this is easy." Never stop working at it. You know, you're you're always gonna hit plateaus or even ravines. You know, and, and you just gotta to stick it out and uh, and get to the other side somehow, just like all of your heroes have. And I think it's important to remember that even the greatest creators out there have gone through those difficult times of maybe not feeling so inspired, but, uh, um, you know, you have those guys to look to when you're feeling that yourself. Um, I'd say whatever you're doing, don't quit and don't be ashamed. And if you feel humiliated, just, um, keep your head down and keep digging through it, because there's something, something good and everybody that, that they can say. And the more they practice it, the, the better they're going to be able to express it. So, I think it's kind of, it can be just humiliating to put yourself out there like that. <clears throat> and um, sometimes if you, if you do it enough times and you humiliate yourself enough times, it can just start to be fun. And then you kind of let go. And then you might just learn that that's how you can start expressing yourself even better. Just trying to do a, a good job with, you know, if you play bluegrass music or if I play bluegrass, I try to pay tribute to everything that I thought was good about that music or great about it and, and the people that played it, you know. I'm really trying to, trying to mo mostly play things kind of the way I think uh, they are intended to be played, you know, as, a, as opposed to like altering them. I'm kind of a preservationist when it, 
but I, I don't I don't really uh, you know I, I let my personality come come out enough but I'm not gonna go wacko over it playing a Bill Monroe tune I'm gonna try to honor that tradition there just go for it I think the thing that I see in myself and in people around me who are very creative people and who are unhappy it's because they're they won't go for it you know, maybe I'll be talking to somebody and <clears throat> they'll use a word that I don't normally use and I'll start thinking about that word and the sounds of it and like what does it mean what does it sound like it should mean you know just things that think about it differently and, and let that springboard and and it may lead you to another word it leads you to a, to a thought that might start forming a story and then you know go from there and it's like what does that story sound like does it sound happy does it sound you know sad does it sound um, you know really really close does it sound like it's gonna be you know kinda echoey and far away and that can help shape like where do you begin like do you want to start in a minor chord do you want to start you know do you want it to be like you know a happy you know upbeat you know walking pace where you're just leisurely strolling through the forest or you know is it you know you're kinda looking around at every corner and y your pace is gonna be different um, so I just starting from one little one point and it's I think it's really just allowing yourself to change your perspective and um, I think that's one thing that people are most afraid to do is is look at a normal or look at a situation that they think they have their mind made up about and think about it in like ten other ways or five ways you know just think of like what are five other perspectives on this and that can help you create a story that um, is unique and that you know, you wouldn't ever have approached if you hadn't given yourself that that like inner freedom to kind of just to look somewhere else or to think about it differently. Go for it and don't let anything stop you. Really, just kind of create and keep keep creating. Everyone needs to be creative to keep us reconnected to our conduit to. The to the dreamland, dream time. And we realize that that this plant, this green energy here, the energy that's in us, we're all connected. It's not something separate. And uh, what we do to it, we do to ourselves. So, we we, um, we have to seek beauty more often. If you look for the, the kind of situations that sort of give you good feedback, that feed your, your inner self, um, then you're putting money in the bank. You know? Then you've got more creative uh, energy to draw on. It's either, you know, love is creativity and, and fear is, you know, on the other side of that. And, constant battle, you know, no matter what it is or what you're doing, you know, that's the, that's the love and fear thing. Yeah, I was just reading about Mike Seeger. He was so devoted to his art, you know, but he didn't write songs. He just learned all the old songs. Probably in his next life he'll come back as like a brilliant composer with all that stuff that he learned in his last lifetime. Um, there's practical things, of course. Keep a notebook, write every day. Even if you don't know what you're trying to say, write it down. Um, I think study some classical poetry uh, to, to see the breadth and scope of subject matter, but also the, you know, Edna, St. Vincent Millay, and Robert Frost, uh, William Butler Yeats, John Keats. These are the people that I, they write in rhythm, you know. They're not trying to be abstract and subtle. They write in a rhythm, and the rhythm drives the words, and the poetry becomes musical. So I find that very helpful to, even in a diary, to write in a kind of, 
maybe iambic pentameter verse form, four lines. Yeah. And learn how to make chai. Chai is a great writer's friend. In the final analysis, everyone is who they are. And it's kind of the easiest way is to just be yourself. But of course, you have to develop yourself to where you could recognize that and tap into it. Well, all the different things I do, uh, whether it's uh, writing mandolin tunes or uh, recording them, making mandolin bridges, uh, different lines of work that I'm involved with, and now running the Murky Method tapes, figuring out ways to do different things electronically and so forth. These are the things that I can do. I figure different people have different things that they can do. And they're not going to be the same as the things anybody else does. And these are the things that I can do. And so when I discovered that there were particular things that I could do, then I decided to just concentrate on those. And so to me, that's how they're all related. Just because I happen to be able to do this particular set of things. And, uh, and so that's what I want to concentrate on. I'd rather do the things that I can be pretty good at and try to do the things that are not. As long as I was in school and growing up and stuff, it started off in elementary school, and it may just be because they do this more in elementary school, but it started off that we had art classes and we were doing all these creative things and we were like really, you know, like creativity was just thrown at you and it was like, you don't have a, you don't have a choice, like you're going to exercise your creativity. And I feel like now it's kind of the opposite. It's like creativity doesn't really have a place or like, thinking outside of the box, it's like, okay, X plus Y equals Z. You know, it's not like X plus Y can equal a tree if you want it to be or whatever it is. But, um, and, and so it's, it's just make sure they learn all the things that they have to learn, test them, and then get them out of the school. And it's left up to everybody else in the world to foster their creativity. But I think it should be a blend. Like, it used to be that we had music, we had art, we had, you know, all these other things that were incorporated into learning that made it a creative process, you know, in combination with acquiring that other type of knowledge. So I think, I think that I would like to see it go back more to the way that it was and that it was an integral part of, of something you did every day. And it wasn't, oh, uh, creativity is just for people who have this gift or, you know, it's, it's been isolated, I think, for a lot of people. And I think I'd like to, to see everybody know that they have the possibility and the capability of being creative. It's just like, how do you want to do it? You, you know, what feels good or what, what do you feel it like comes easier to you? Like sometimes for me, it's not music. It's like, um, thinking of a creative way to, to help somebody or, you know, to do a hundred different other things. Um, maybe it'll be a creative way to like rake the yard. It, it doesn't matter, but it's like everybody has that, has that like light within them of creativity. It's just a matter of kind of tapping in how they want to express it, how they feel good expressing it, and um, you know, just the avenue that they want to take with how it comes out. But I think a lot of people are, are stifled thinking, I don't have any creativity or I'm not a creative person. And that's not, I don't think that's true at all. There's a, you know, I think, I think this thing about creativity can, can freeze a lot of people up about thinking that they're not creative. They're, 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 it's, like, it's like asking people, can, do you sing? And they go, oh, no, don't sing. No, I have no rhythm. I don't sing. I, 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 just, I can't draw. I can't. It's just like, whoa. My, 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 my answer is usually, do you, do you know Row Row Your Boat? Oh, yeah, but that's, do you, can you sing Row Row? Yeah, yeah, I can. Anybody can write a tune as long as they can sing a tune. You could fog a mirror and you can sing. Okay, you can sing. Do you walk? Yeah. Well, you got rhythm. Unless you're walking some... But if you're going one, two, one, two, you want... I don't know. You, you can build on those things if you choose to. Are you creative? You know, creativity? Yes, people have taken something simple as walking and made it into a dancing. Yes, they yes yes they have, but they just kept adding on to a basic thing. I'm just doing this. To I'm doing you know this to 
ballet to choreography to whatever you want to talk about. Basically, it comes from walking. And when I first started playing, everybody said, I wanted to play dobro, and everybody said, well, you should play guitar first and learn some chords, blah, blah, blah. And I just thought, I don't want to play guitar. <laughs> it's not what I'm getting excited about. So if you're new to music or new to creating, I think you should follow that passion because that will get you through the lean times, you know, the uh, times when you want to quit because you're not where you want to be or you're frustrated musically or, you know, whatever. Uh, I think that you, con I constantly go back to that inspiration and I look for new inspiration, you know, new music that, I, that gets me excited or new people to work with. Um, a new microphone, you know, whatever. Um, but uh, but I would say that uh, follow that passion. People going about, well, you have to, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. I think that even if you're not physically playing, just being obsessed with your instrument and thinking about it all the time is maybe more important than practicing. Um, somebody asked Ralph Mooney, the steel guitarist Ralph Mooney, uh, if he practiced a lot, and he said, no, well, I do, but just in my mind. And I think that there's something really powerful about that, that, you know, even if you leave it in the case for a few days, when you do pick it up, it's like you've, you've always kind of been in there in that case, too. I've had a couple experiences, like, um, in a class setting, trying to get everybody to compose something together which I think can be really fun and maybe doesn't always necessarily create like the most succinct kind of result that maybe makes a ton of sense, but I think it's really fun and, and at least sort of eye-opening um, where everybody gets like a certain amount of either like rhythmical space, like everybody gets a bar or a phrase or, or to be like you can have two notes and they can be like any length that you want and I think that's really fun to do with people who maybe like either don't even know that many tunes to begin with or like have never written anything before and don't even think about that being a possibility and uh, I think so. that could be actually really great to get somebody going who doesn't necessarily think of making up melodies just in their spare time for fun and uh, they might have kind of that sort of beginner's insight, you know, where they come up with something really great, even though they've never tried to compose something before and don't have, like, preconceived notions of what a good song is. No jam session's gonna really have the mojo if somebody's, if somebody walks into it thinking, oh man, I wish there were better pickers here, you know, I wish, I wish there, there were some more guys on my level here. Because that's really not what uh, getting down and playing music is about. My pet peeve would, would be I'd, I'd get three or four guys around a campsite that can that are really great players, and we'd be jamming and, and playing some really good bluegrass. And then next thing you know, there's 17 banjo players that barely know where they're at. And they're so loud that you can't hear anything else. Now, that just drives me nuts. But the thing is, is that, uh, and I have to step back and breathe, and I go, you know what? What they're doing right now is making them extremely happy. And who am I to, 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 to make that stop? So I just kind of bear through it and go, it is what it is, and God bless you. You know, and that's what I tell musicians uh, that are down on themselves, you know, about, uh, well, I really can't play that well and everything. And I always tell them, I say, does it make you happy? Does it make you feel warm inside? Oh, yeah, it makes me happy. I said, you're there. It's all about finding the connections that are there and sort of emphasizing them, sort of maybe getting into one thing. And if, if you're playing with somebody who's not as talented as you are or needs a little help in their process or journey, maybe you want to, you know, in a very nice way, foc focus the jam on grooving or, you know, focus the jam on singing harmony parts in tune or singing baritone in tune, you know. You can, there's always something you can teach somebody, and there's always something you can learn from them. I like musical creativity that has good feeling in it, uh, positive feeling. You know, even with the bluegrass songs that are about negative things, we get a positive feeling from playing the songs.
camp out, um, canoe, uh, walk in the woods on in the parks. Uh, but that's my bias, you know. That's not where most music is written. It's written at a table or at a desk or someplace. All those years I sat there on Music Row and wrote songs for the marketplace and everything. And it was it was fine, good experience. I you know I made I made enough money to have my my dream and, and so it was good, but along with that comes a pretty high level of critiquing, you know, from from the publishers and the the producers and the artists and everything, you know, I mean you're you're laying it out there for them to, to take and, and, and it becomes a part of their career too. So they do sort of have a stake in it. And it it really it wasn't easy for me to take. And uh, that was I think part of the reason that after so many years I quit sort of aiming in that direction and started writing songs for my own purpose, which is to stand up in front of people and share my thoughts and experiences. What I'm trying to do now is be keen to the to the connections that I have with other people and how I can involve other people in what in my experience. You know, you take your time and you kind of listen and you settle down and you go, okay, well, let me figure it out. How does how does it work? And you go. Uh, we talked about creativity. Creativity is just one little piece of what you need to, to succeed because you also need the tools to, to know what to do with your creativity after you've created. So okay, so, okay, you came up with a great idea. You came up with a cool lick. You came up with a half of a good tune. You know, now what? Now what? You know, and to me, that's the craft. Creativity is like just one little piece of it. So that's like the, the juice and the inspiration and um, the, the, the raw raw gold but now you have to figure out how to make it into you know a jewel you get that inspiration and then taking it back to my my desk which really is my bed and just sitting on my bed and writing down the rest of the lyrics and I hear the melody with the lyric as I'm writing down the lyric like it makes sense song wise and then I go to an instrument either my fiddle or a guitar or ukulele or a piano and try to either replay that melody or play like the rhythmic a concept I hear behind it and then build that build that into the chord changes that I hear behind it and hopefully it comes out as a song and sometimes it only gets stuck somewhere in the middle of the process and there's like a hundred half written songs in my book right now that I wish could just get to that place where I can actually hear it out loud. Inspiration just triggers a thought and that thought becomes manifested into uh, work and if you don't work you don't get nothing out of it you've got inspiration it takes a whole lot of work to bring to show what you've been inspired by a lot of us spend our life just being inspired you know that's, that's me you know I've spent a whole lot of time man wouldn't that be good or wouldn't that be great and but I realize you have to put your hand to the helm and if you're ever going to get anywhere with it. See, I spent my whole life believing I was going to be on the Grand Ole Opry and I was going to do this and I was going to do this and I, I was going to do all this stuff. And God says, no, this is what you're going to do. And, uh, and I'm going to bless you the way you are. And uh, you know, there's a, a verse in the Bible about uh, the olive tree saying uh, it wouldn't serve, it wouldn't become uh, the king because it said, you know, what, why, why would I want to be the king of a tree? You know, I'm just making olive oil. What am I going to do? Stop making olive oil and be something I'm not? You know, so the olive tree knew what it, who it was, and uh, a lot of times that's what you got to find out is who you are, because you might not be the next big thing that's going to happen in country or bluegrass music, but you might be the guy that writes the songs. See, I, I was going to be the singer and, and entertainer. No, I became the songwriter. God put me in another place, and uh, it's kind of good because when you find out, it's just kind of let go and let it be that way it kind of depends on his guidance and you know, puts you where you're supposed to be. That's good. Being able to <clears throat> kind of uh, make
like a symbolic representation of what your unconscious might look like if you were able to tell somebody else. I guess you would sing that to somebody else, or you'd paint it to somebody else, or write it out to somebody else, or tell a story about it. Yeah. That might have a lot to do with archetypes, if you're mm -hmm. able to express that part of your unconscious that other people might be able to um, associate with. They might be able to pick up on the strong symbols, which might be, might be your the runs you use or the shapes you use and that kind of thing. So. I think uh, the relationship of the unconscious with creativity is complete. I think creativity comes out of the unconscious. I think there's a pipeline there, and with some people it's more apparent or more open than with other people. But I think that's where creativity comes from. But you have to pay attention. You have to have your antenna turned on. You know, you got to, got to have your radar out there. And, uh, and then there's no telling what you'll pick up. I would encourage everybody, even if you just draw stick figures and stuff, to, you know, elaborate on that and keep at it. And the world would be a better place if everybody was channeling their creative energy instead of just bottling it up inside. And, you know, wasting it on, on on not creating. Do it. Make something. Just start and just start doing it and it doesn't matter if they're if someone likes it or not, you should just do it because of the way it makes you feel. And just to keep building on that. And um, yeah, don't be afraid of it. I love creativity. <laughs> I think it's it's what allows us to connect to one another and really see people for who they really are because I think people are expressions of of creativity and they might not say it they might not be able to say about themselves what you see when you hear them playing their music or what you see when you see a painting that they've painted or a book that they've written. A part of someone comes out that you might never have met just at an office space or sitting and having coffee even because you, it's such a deep expression of the human being and I think it's the greatest part of life. Well, I think it's been everything in my life. It, I don't know where I would be without it. It was actually with that gig with Buddy. I hadn't played my fiddle in so long, Chris. My hands are like just not happening because of all the work I'm doing really stiff. I have to work them in the morning just to like, I've never cracked like that ever, <laughs> but they're cracking now. But um, <clears throat> I haven't touched my fiddle. I was feeling awful about it. And Buddy calls me up. He's like, Amanda, is Billy home? He's like, no, he's not home, Buddy. Well, do you want to play a gig with me? It's in a half an hour. If you come over right now, we can run all the tunes. <laughs> it's like, Buddy, Amanda, <laughs> please. Okay, fine, I'll be right over. I mean, I was like this, right? <laughs> Just been working in the garden. What am I doing? What am I doing? So we go and play at this old folks' home and met a man named Wilbur. And he's 103 years old. And he got up and he played harmonica, like, killer right yeah. and he played some howling wolf and he's just awesome and I t had a really nice conversation with him afterwards and he's completely competent he's a farmer he told me all about his life and his parents it's just amazing to have a conversation with him but buddy asked him after he got finished playing a blues what his secret was he's 103 years old he's like, what is your secret Wilbur? and he said look at the horse <laughs> And he said to me, well, he said to everybody, but he said to me afterwards also, he just said, live so God can use you. And I was like, really? That's all you need to do. Live so God can use you. Yeah, they say, you know, dance as if no one is watching. Well play mandolin like nobody was listening and then 
find out what you do best and, and then go play where people are listening. Uh, has your creativity matured over the years? Oh, I would say definitely so. Just, uh, I mean, the song that I mentioned, uh, Riding Around on Saturday Night, one of the first songs that I wrote. Good good little song, but not too much depth to it. Uh, you know, and then as you get older and you grow and you have more experiences, you get you hopefully get more depth as a person. Uh, so the song, you know, the uh, last songs I've written, or more recent songs, is a song I wrote about my... Uh, mom and dad having Alzheimer's, and uh, which is a much deeper subject for starters than riding around on Saturday night. And it starts out as, uh, the lines are, old age is not for sissies, I heard my mother say. Uh, and it's talking about uh, her having Alzheimer's. And, and uh, that song was written in response to uh, a comment you know somebody had made about mama having Alzheimer's that uh, uh, she's a very religious woman and her religion means a lot to her. And they said, well, you know, you know, you've got Alzheimer's, and eventually you'll forget about Jesus. And that just spoke to me. That that line spoke to me because I knew, of course, that if Mama did forget about Jesus, that Jesus would never forget about her. And so uh, that's that's what the chorus said. You know, I'll never forget about you. I'll never forget about you. Even if you forget me, I'll never forget about you. And that's a much deeper subject than right around on Saturday night. So I'm really... Uh, you know, I'm proud of that song. It's not one that, uh, well, of course, I don't perform a lot out anymore, but uh, the times I have performed it, it's uh, people have liked it a lot, and that, you know, that makes me happy that, that something that personal could, could touch into other people. Um, and then, uh, you know, since I'm not playing out a lot right now and doing a lot of creative songwriting, uh, a lot of my creativity uh, goes now into uh, just artwork that I'm uh, doing for my own personal pleasure. Uh, which is, that's that's really fun. I'm enjoying that. Um, and I think part of my creativity as I'm thinking about it has always been in trying to find creative ways to teach uh, and creative ways to relate to students and to help them to learn how to play. And that, that feels creative to me in a different way that songwriting does or doing artwork feels. But it is uh, very satisfying to to realize if you've taken a particular approach to teaching and somebody can actually play the guitar or they can actually play the banjo as John Hartford said uh, or play the bass so they can get together with their friends and make a little music I mean, and I've had a small part in in being the uh, facilitator for that or the, the little little germ that gets them all going that, that's a very creative thing for me and it makes me very happy so uh, last question yeah how would you advise someone or, um, you know, what would you tell someone who's just beginning to unlock their own creativity? Anything well, that might have helped you or, or just some things that, that ping on your radar about helping people just get their motor running creatively? Well, I always felt like when I was writing a song, I mean, it was just or, or in, a, in a songwriting place that I really, sounds like a cliche and it sounds very trite, but I just had to be open to the experience of writing a song, which for me meant, you know, you just open your mind to it, and I'd carry the notebook around with me in the car. I guess people now use digital recording devices. But anything that would catch my ear or eye, I would write it down. And then never, ever thought I'd remember it, because, of course, you won't remember it. And then when, when you've got things written down, if you're feeling the urge, it's like an itch, you know, to, to follow that, then you have to follow it. You can't stop and say, okay, I, like, of course, I guess occasionally you have to say, I don't have time for it, but I promise I'll get back to it. But if it's possible to follow that energy, and so, of course, that you have to be aware of your own energy. Uh, and you can't just let your life get cluttered up with doing dishes and vacuuming and going to Starbucks and doing crossword puzzles. You have to just have some time for it. I mean, I remember the, one of the last songs that I wrote, somebody had had said a phrase, uh, it was about all related to square dancing, and, and my square dance caller says, if you get to the dance hall before me, save me a square on the floor. I thought that was an old square dance saying, and he said it was not. Uh, so I wrote that down. Just, I'm riding in the car, I write it down, because why it strikes my ear, it's got a good cadence to it. So we just laid around the house for, I don't know, weeks maybe, I'm in the shower. I'm thinking about that line, and, and what happened to the line changed, so here's the energy coming in. I'm going like, 
if I get to the if I get to the dance hall before me, my darling, there's the cadence, there's the power. Save me a square on the floor, and I'm going like, oh my gosh, I have to get I have to get out of the shower right now and write that down. So that's what I'm doing. I'm following the energy. I'm not just going like, okay, let me finish my shower. This is not important because then the energy goes away. You have to be respectful of it. You know, so while you've got the energy going, you know, then you do the hard work, which is to sit down however you, your process is. It mine's with the guitar. And you write that down and then see if anything else is coming. Sometimes you get things easy and sometimes not. But I think just to be open to wherever your energy is taking. I mean, Joseph Campbell, of course, said it the best, follow your bliss. But it's easy to say that and, like, harder to do. I would, you know, say be aware of your energy and wherever that energy is taking you. Go with it. Sometimes it's going to be a dead end, but the more you <clears throat> tap into it and the more you respect it, uh, then I think it, it continues to give back to you. The end. <laughs> <laughs>